Hey everybody, Ryan McCaffrey here at IGN. This is IGN Unfiltered, my monthly sit down with one of the best, brightest, most fascinating minds in the games industry. Today I am extraordinarily pleased to be joined by Ted Price, the CEO founder of Insomniac, makers of Marvel's Spider-Man. That is the latest and greatest game from them. Ted, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for coming. Uh, and there is a lot to get to. Obviously, it's you're not here for your health. We're going to promote some Spider-Man. There he is on the wall behind me. Uh, we're all playing the game. By the time this interview airs, the game's out. Uh, hopefully, everybody likes it because we're, we're recording this before all the reviews Fingers come crossed. out. So yeah. we'll see. But what I want to start, I always like to start in the in the beginning with people because everybody comes from somewhere uh, nobody's just literally born into the games industry it's such a young industry so uh, you're from Virginia yep. yes okay. uh, did you play a lot of games when you were a kid were you a gamer early on I did my parents got my sister and me an Atari 2600 when it came out for the first time we were really lucky because yeah. we were one of the first groups of kids on our in our neighborhood to have one and so my sister and I would play Combat, uh, Adventure, Yard's Revenge. I mean, the, the list goes on and on every weekend because we weren't allowed to play games during the week. Oh, okay. So my, so my so playing was somewhat and limited. Homework, yeah. And then. yeah. <laughs> but more than that, uh, my father also got us an Apple IIe, which really in, in awakened my interest in programming. Sure. And I used to make really simple and pretty bad games on the, uh, on the Apple. But You remember the first one you made? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was, there was a game called Alice, Alice or something, and at, you were taking Alice on the Apple IIe through some labyr labyrinthine adventure, and I wanted to make a game that was similar, so I made a game about a house, and you walk through the house, and you get to, you get to outfit the house with various things. It was sort of a Sims-like huh. thing in 2D, and it was terrible. It was really boring. <laughs> There was really no game loop. It was just me trying to put stuff on the screen and make a character move around and. But you learned a lot. Obviously. I did. I mean, it was it was the itch was scratched. Yes, and since then I I had always sort of started. I started and stopped a lot of projects along the way as I was moving towards college. But it was fun. Were uh, what was? Do you have a favorite game from your childhood? Any one that sort of stood out? I'd say the Atari 2600 adventure for yeah. me was the first time that I really felt that games had were, were sort of these open, boundless opportunities because I was constantly filling in the blanks while I was moving this sort of duck-shaped character. Or wait, no, it was the dragons that were duck-shaped. It was me. I was the <laughs> arrow, I guess, or yeah. the, the no, the, the block. I'm totally misremembering this. <laughs> it's been a little okay. while since Adventure. You're forgiven. There was the block, and you would get the sword, and there was the duck-like dragon that you had to kill, and there was no save, right? So every time you died, you would go back to the beginning. But it was really fertile ground for me as somebody who was interested in game design and is what you could do with a screen and a controller. Yeah. I guess was was Adventure the original roguelike? <laughs> you died, yeah, I guess it probably was. The beginning. Yeah. Um, were your parents so as you start to dabble in in programming and, and actually creating things with the Apple IIe, are your parents super supportive of that? Even you know you got the weekend restriction on the on the game, the computer usage and the game playing. So did they did they sort of see that and and nurture that or encourage that or were they were they sort of just dismissive of it at all? Or? Oh, not dismissive of all at all. My parents are very supportive. I mean, my dad would drive me to the Apple store or the library and we'd pick up books on coding and that was incredibly helpful. And the fact that they had in the first place gotten an Apple IIe after I had said, hey dad, I'm interested in making games. I mean, cool. that was the reason for getting the Apple oh, II. Good. Uh, that to me showed that they were, even though they weren't gamers themselves, they were interested in supporting this creative activity. Is that, oh boy, that's, I'll bet, looking, in hindsight, that's got to feel really good, right? Like they've, they're probably even more proud of you than they normally would have been because that, that they helped nurture it, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it wasn't just that. My parents were also very supportive of just independence in general. And so my brother and my sisters and I all had a lot of freedom to choose the things that we were interested in, to go places to take risks that maybe most parents wouldn't have supported. Yeah. Uh, and that, that was awesome. And I, as a parent myself now, uh, it makes me really interested in, in supporting the same for my kids, especially when it comes to games. My kids are all gamers, and yeah. I encourage my kids to code as well, and my youngest in particular codes and with a, with a particular passion for coding games. And that makes me really 
happy. That's awesome. So are, what are what are the games that they're influenced by? Is it Minecraft or, or a little, I mean, I know everybody's playing Fortnite now, but what do you see as sort of the, the things that are inspiring them now? I think the one game that really is generating a lot of creative enthusiasm is Roblox. Because Roblox has a pretty impressive tool set, despite yeah. the fact that the, primitive, the graphics are fairly primitive, you can do anything as long as you know a little Lua and maybe read a few tutorials and have a vision for what it is you want to accomplish in the game. Yeah, that's true. That's, uh, I know it's been, it's like one of those, it's not something the IGN audience uh, really, or at least the IGN staff really pays a close attention to, but yeah, like I know even there's, there's an Xbox client and it's huge. You can go yeah. on there and you can upload stuff and I think you can even make, make a little bit of money on there. Uh, yes, there are people yeah. making serious money, according yeah. to my son, on <laughs> Roblox. I haven't done the research, but the numbers are, are pretty huge in terms of the number of people who are playing and just the, the general interest that we don't hear a lot about. Right, right. So uh, you're clearly a good student. You went to Princeton, an Ivy League school. Uh, what, what did you study there and, and what what uh, did you dream of doing when you got out? What was the original vision for the future of Ted Price? Well, I studied English. I was an English major. And I originally had gone in thinking I was going to be a computer science major. But I made the mistake of taking a 200-level computer science class my freshman year versus a starting level? where yeah. most people would. And I, I was just completely overwhelmed and got a little bit intimidated. So I, I dropped that class and started taking English, which was another passion of mine, and just went from there. As far as what I wanted to do when I got out, I was somewhat undecided. I had a lot of opportunities, and I ended up moving out to California to work uh, at my uncle's company. He ran a startup medical company, and it sounded like a fantastic challenge and something that was really interesting. Yeah, well, I'm curious to hear more about that, because uh, it's you're a a controller for a medical company? I don't even quite know what that means. That's a, it's a, it's a finance thing, isn't financial it? Financial controller. I ended yeah. up being the financial controller for the company, but I started out as a medical technician. So my uncle had invented these vans that you, uh, would, would, these vans had, were equipped at the level of an emergency room. Okay. And they, he, a doctor and a technician would drive out to patients' homes and deliver the same kind of care you could actually get in an emergency room, but oh, wow. in the home which was a fantastic service for those who were perhaps homebound or too elderly to do anything but go to the emergency room when they had a minor problem. And this is, this is early 90s, pre-internet, pre, you know, the world was not super networked at this point, right? That's right. So it was in, I, I moved out in 1990 to California and the company had already been going and they had several vans. And so I was a part of that process. In fact, I was sort of a guinea pig. I was, my, my uncle was, wanted to know if he could take a college grad teach the grad how to do, how to develop x-rays, draw blood, analyze the blood under the supervision of a physician, and, and go from there. And my problem was, uh, you mentioned we didn't have internet back then, or really widespread internet. Yeah. We had to navigate with just the old school maps. So I would yep. drive the vans and drive around with a Thomas guide in my lap through San Diego, kind of wondering where the hell am I? <laughs> Are we gonna be late? I'm, and I would get lost all the time, and that was a problem. So eventually, I was moved out of the vans and became the financial controller of the company, and I was lucky enough to uh, learn a lot about finance very quickly. Even that's, that's a heck of a pivot from both computer science and, and English to then finance. You're, you're clearly an adaptable, multi-talented, bright well, guy if you, can, if you can slip into that successfully. My uncle had a lot of faith in me. So. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I, I, I had the opportunity to learn from some really, really smart people who were, who were there. Uh, we were working with some venture capitalists as well, and I got a chance to work hand, side by side with them on performas and business plans. And that was, again, it was sort of like going to business school without having to go to business school. Right. Uh, at the same time, I got to do some programming there too, programming databases, which was a lot of fun for me. So a startup, a st any startup company, anybody will tell you who's been in one, people wear a lot of different hats and the opportunities are there for anybody who wants to take them. And as a 20 something year old, I was all over that because I didn't have any, anything else to do. Sure. So I would just yeah. work all the time and, and jump in whenever help was needed. So how does the pivot happen from that, from all that to founding Insomniac in 1994? Well, 
while the medical company continued to grow, I realized that my passion wasn't necessarily medicine. I was surrounded by people who were absolutely, uh, who dreamed of providing the best possible care to, care to patients. But I, I wasn't a pre-med person. I didn't have any desire to become a doctor. So I started thinking that I was missing the opportunity to scratch the creative itch that I had as a kid where I was programming games. Sure. And I, I wanted to do something similar and realized that, well, if I'm programming now, maybe I could program games and start a game company. And being again, being a 20-something year old and not knowing what I didn't know, uh, I figured, okay, I'll just start a game company. And I had saved up a lot of money uh, from just doing absolutely nothing but working. Right. And incorporated as Extreme Software in 1994. That's such a 90s name. It was. X <laughs> X-T-R-E-M-E. Oh, it's even with just yes. the X. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I wasn't consulting many people about name choices back then, but started it, it was just me in a little 10 by 10 office, and I bought a 3DO dev kit and a PC and started programming and realized very quickly that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Uh, I knew plenty about programming databases, but nothing when it came to programming graphics. And my mother, back in Virginia, was at a party and she had, was talking about how her son had started a video game company. And of course, it was just me in this little tiny room. Yeah. And a friend of hers said, well, my roommate uh, has, sorry, m my son's roommate at Princeton, he happened to also go to Princeton, uh, is a brilliant programmer and your son should call him. And this is, uh, this is Al Hastings, who was one of my partners. <laughs> and I called Al from California, and Al was in just his- Just cold called him. Just cold called him. Got, got the number from my mom, cold yeah. called him, and he was about to graduate. He was in the last months of his senior year, and I explained what I was trying to do. And he said, sounds pretty good. Okay. So he flew out to San Diego. I mean, wow. he's, a, he's a man of very few words. <laughs> so he flew out to San Diego. We hit it off. Uh, he agreed to join after he graduated, and he joined the late spring of 1994, and we began working on the demo for our first game. He jumped in, built this amazing engine in a span of a month, just coded it from scratch. I was doing the art and the animation, and we recorded it on a videotape, and we literally drove up and down the West Coast, cold calling every publisher we had heard of, yeah. showing them this videotape. And, wow. that's how, and that's, that was the first <laughs> few months. That's crazy. So uh, at least, is this the same game as the, what you ended up shipping, which is Disruptor? Yeah. So that's Disruptor, which ended up shipping for PlayStation 1, but. You just mentioned to it, it was originally, you were working on it for 3D, the 3DO, 3DO the That's Panasonic right. 3DO. Yeah. So how, uh, do you just see the writing on the wall with 3DO at one point? Like, uh, the system's not really working, we should, we should shift gears here? How, does, how do you end up on PlayStation? Well, it, it was a few things that happened between Al coming out to California and, and getting to that decision. Yeah. Uh, the, a big thing was that Brian Hastings, who is Al's brother, joined. So as soon as we secured a deal with Universal Interactive Studios, uh, we, were, we asked, what are we going to do now? We need some help. And Al said, well, we should call Brian. Because Brian was already working in a, in a real job, a great <laughs> programmer as well. So Brian agreed to join, and the three of us began working in earnest on Disruptor. Yeah. And during our deal with Universal, uh, 3DO was going through its ups and downs. And I think everybody was sort of waiting for it to explode. And it didn't. And at the same time, Sony had been preparing the launch of the PlayStation, and then I think did launch it. And the, I can't remember what the actual sequence of events was, but there was a point in the middle of development of Disruptor where we met with the head of Universal and with Mark Cerny, who was our executive producer. And I remember we went out to lunch in LA, and uh, the head of their publishing group said, "You know, guys, it doesn't look like 3DO is going to do very well. We should." you guys should probably consider switching to the PlayStation. And my thought was, oh, we're so screwed. <laughs> we're gonna have to rewrite the engine and, and uh, figure out what the constraints are for the PlayStation. And Al, of course, said, yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, Al rewrote the engine, and I, I recall it was about a week. Wow. And it was up and running on the PlayStation. It probably was more than a week, but Al should be here to correct me. And we just moved on, and that was probably the, the first really good decision we made. <laughs> And Disruptor did eventually come out for the PlayStation, and it was, I remember reading reviews where people said, this is the best game that nobody's heard of, because there was no <laughs> marketing campaign. It was one poster and maybe a t-shirt, and that was about it. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so how do you feel about Disruptor in hindsight? 
I was, it was a great experience for all of us. We, all of us who were at Insomniac, the five of us, I think, at, by the time we shipped, learned how to make games with Disruptor. And we learned, uh, and I think in great part, thanks to the mentorship of Mark Cerny and Michael John, who was our producer at Universal at the time. And we had a lot of fun. I, I think we had intended the game to be sort of a serious, dark shooter, but we, when we wrote the story and began recording the videos, because we had videos for stories, not right. CG, they were so goofy and so unintentionally <laughs> cheesy that the game was sort of a comedy. But uh, it was fun, and that was re what really counted. You, you, you go through and you, you earn your psionics and your weapons and your upgrades, and it's a blast. It's a really, it's a good game. Do you ever go back and play it from time to time? Do you ever fire up a PS1 and it's been a while ago? I think the last time was about a decade ago. Yeah, I played it, but I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm biased, but I think it holds up okay. Have you? Do you ever give any thought to revisiting it, or is it more of just a like, well, that was our learning project, that was our, tra those were our training wheels? Yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> if the audience would react well to it. I, I, I will say that we've taken uh, sort of a lot of the ideas from it and, and integrated them into our current games, and I do think there's there's room for somebody to bring back psionics. For me, that was the coolest part of the game. This whole, yeah. whole you have psionics and you have weapons and there's this interaction between them. In fact, uh, PsyOps from Midway did that a little bit for, so it was PS2 original Xbox era, as I remember. They yeah. Kind of went down that road a little bit. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I know you're right. You're, <laughs> you know more about that than I do, so. Um, does it fill you, so let's move on to the next game. So there's, is behind me over here, right, right behind my head. Spyro, do, uh, does it fill you with pride to see Spyro getting remastered now and coming back around? Absolutely. I mean, the Toys for Bob guys are doing an amazing job, and we were lucky enough to uh, talk to them early on. They they asked, could could you guys take a look at what we're doing and give us some feedback? And they were nailing it, which was really yeah. fantastic for us as uh, the original creators, but looking at a team that had has a lot of love for the franchise. Right. We had also been getting a lot of questions from fans over the years. Hey, are you ever going to do the original Spyro? And it just it never worked out. And we, we just had other things that we were working on. And as a matter of fact, when we shipped this third Spyro, it, we had sort of hit a wall. We realized that there really wasn't much that we felt we could do to push the gameplay much further. And that's why we had introduced other characters into mm -hmm. the franchise. Uh, so we were content moving on and, and waving goodbye to Spyro, um, but then when Skylanders blew up, it was sort of a, <laughs> sort of a God, did we really do that? Did we, should we have moved on? But I mean, kudos to Activision for, for taking that franchise and doing what they did, and now uh, I'm excited to play the Toys for Bob game. Yeah, did you, I mean, did you have any thought at the time that it would still, that Spyro would still be beloved 20 years later? No, no, I mean, I don't think, as, I don't think any developer ever really thinks too hard about it. Yeah. We, we hope, we, our fingers are crossed, that any franchise we create continues to, to exist and be loved by fans, but you never know. Where, uh, where'd the idea for Ratchet & Clank come from? Very unique Yeah, that, duo. Ratchet & Clank was sort of a Hail Mary for us in that after we had, let's see, where were we in our development? After, after Spyro, we had developed a strong relationship with Sony because Sony had published Spyro, even though Universal yeah. was the sort of the middleman in the whole deal. And we wanted to move on to something that was a little bit more mature because we love Spyro, but we felt, okay, let's, let's take advantage of a growing audience out there that's a little bit more mature. Yeah. And we began working on a game that was an open, wasn't really open world, it was more of a linear adventure which featured a girl who had a stick, and we called it Girl with the Stick. And it involved magic and big lumbering beasts, and it had a sort of a darker tone. Pu uh, Sony was going to publish it, and we got, must have been six to eight months into, into development, and we had a prototype, and it was, it was okay. But Sony, I remember uh, Sony came down and they said, you know what, guys, this looks cool, but you might consider going back to what you're really good at. You guys are good at platformers. And I said, no, no, <laughs> we put so much effort into this, into this game, this girl with a stick game, it's gonna be great. And the team is looking at me going, Ted, you're crazy. <laughs> we really think we should go back and do what we're good at. And uh, we said, okay, and I said, okay, let's just, let's just can girl with a stick and figure out something else. And so we gave ourselves a very short time to come up with a new idea. 
And Brian Hastings, who I'd mentioned before, also one of the partners at Insomniac, said, well, you know what, let's, let's do this game about a little character who has cool weapons and flies from planet to planet. And that was the genesis of Ratchet. And we began going into heavy brainstorming mode with that idea as the kernel and came up with a lot of different forms for Ratchet. He, he was a lizard at one point. He hmm. was uh, sort of a Marvin the, Marvin the Marching guy, which I think was sort of the original inspiration-esque type creature, and then became a furry fox-like character. And then Clank was originally three robots who would huh. cling, cling to different parts of Ratchet's body, you know, leg, arm, neck. Uh, and we realized that wasn't going to go that well. It was going to be hard to make that work gameplay-wise, so he became one. Huh. robot and then became sort of a backpack for Ratchet. Very interesting. Uh, so how fast way forward and eventually we got a Ratchet and Clank movie. You're one, I mean, just the idea, what's it like to see a thing you made on the big screen? That's kind of cool, right? It's, well, it's, it's surreal. I think every game developer would love to see their franchise transcend media. Yeah, we, I mean, it's nice to have a game, but it's even better to have something that is in, as a movie or a television show or an animated series or a book, just because it means that you're potentially expanding your audience. Right. So it was very cool for all of us to see Ratchet on the big screen. How, uh, how involved were you able to be in that whole process? How, how, did the, how does that even come about? Were you, were you guys trying to work with Sony, who obviously makes motion pictures, yeah. to... To you know, for the for the health and growth of the studio, try, were you trying actively trying to get it made into a movie, or, or do they come to you? Has it all come about? Well, I think I think collectively we've been trying to do something with Ratchet on the big screen for years. I mean, it's ever since the PlayStation Two versions of Ratchet, yeah. we have been talking about how can we how can we create something that's uh, in a different medium. And I, I, talked, I talked to Sony Pictures way, way back. Uh, I, th I know Sony Computer Entertainment had been talking to folks within the company about other options. And it wasn't until just a few years ago that Sony managed to uh, sort of unlock the opportunity by working with different partners. To, and, it, and I think a lot of it had to do with how reasonably priced CG has become now. It's, it's almost become commoditize or democratize. Right, I mean, we, we, it used to be this crazy thing you'd only see in Toy Story in a mega budget movie, and now like half of every kid's cartoon is, yeah. is made that way. Right, and, it's, and that's what's, it's wonderful, right? And it yeah. gives everybody an opportunity to tell your story in a different way, whereas you know, just 10 years ago, there was no way you could take a, a game that wasn't the most popular game on the planet and make it into a, a CG movie. It was just too cost prohibitive. So Sony put the, the deal together with also uh, with Ryan Schneider, who's our chief brand officer, helping out. And we, the parties came together, talked about what we should do, and we decided that T.J. Fixman, who was the original writer on the PlayStation 3 Ratchets, uh, should write the script. And he did. He did a great job on the script. So after that, it was uh, mostly in Sony's court. So Sony was managing the production, working mm -hmm. with the production companies who were creating it, and we were doing whatever we could to support, providing models, uh, art feedback, et cetera. But I, I gotta give a big hand to the production companies, Rainmaker and Blockade, who just rocked it. The visuals were amazing. Did you have any sort of uh, creative oversight on it? Like, are you looking at dailies or any of that kind of stuff, or is it pretty hands-off? So we were, we were reviewing occasional dailies, and we, uh, we would get clips and give feedback on the whether it was matching the world that the worlds that we had built, yeah. because they were drawing heavily from Velden and other places in the Ratchet universe, so we wanted to make sure they got that right. But when it came to creative oversight of the script and the acting, that was we're not movie makers, right? We're not. That's not what we want to do. We want to make games, so we we stayed pretty hands off there. Well. I have to ask, I mean, have we seen the last of Ratchet and Clank? Will they be back? Could, is, a, is a TV series still a possibility for, where, where do you want to see Ratchet and Clank go? I mean, our, our focus is on games. It really is. I mean, that's where we excel, and that's where well, people come to Insomniac because they want to work on games. And yeah. so if there's an opportunity for Ratchet to go somewhere else besides uh, gaming, great. We're open to it. Uh, Resistance. So I feel like Resistance was always a very well liked shooter. Um, PS2 wasn't known as much for first person shooters in the way that Xbox kind of quickly established a, 
I think is fair, a reputation as more of a first-person shooter console. Um, to me, it seems like, even though there were three games, uh, Resistance didn't get the attention that maybe it deserved. How, how do you kind of sort of feel about Resistance in hindsight, looking back? It's funny you asked that. I, it, Resistance was one of my favorite franchises, just because I was creative director on the first two games, yeah. and just, I'm a first-person shooter fan, and having the opportunity to make a first-person shooter, which with what we thought was a fairly unique premise, was a lot of fun. And the fact that it was also, the first one was a launch title for yes. the PlayStation 3 was exhilarating and terrifying at the same time because we were trying to make sure that we were getting everything done by the day that the console launched and dealing with you know, all of the things that tend to change as a console goes from prototype to, to final. But at the same time, it was another learning experience for us where we were, we'd made a first person shooter before, but that was years prior and we were getting, all getting caught up on what best practices were for designing first person shooters, but doing it in our, in our own sort of insomniac way while dealing with the, the trials and tribulations of working on new hardware. So I had a lot of fun. To your point about its reception, it actually got a really positive reception. And that was great. And, and it sold fairly well. Yeah. Always overshadowed by Halo. I mean, no question. And we were also competing at times with Killzone as well on the PlayStation True. 3. So, yeah. you know, and that, that was fine. We, were, we felt like we had created something that had a unique story and a unique take on its weapons, and we were called out in a positive way for it. So that made everybody feel good. I'm, I've, I'm curious about uh, just moving through the, your, the, the resume here, through the, the game log. Uh, Sunset Overdrive, where, you know, you'd been pretty famously at, at this point a, a PlayStation-centric developer, despite the fact that you're, you're uh, independent, which I'll talk to you about in a bit, but... You do. You partner up with Microsoft on Sunset Overdrive, so you know there's a lot of history with you and Sony. How does that come to be? Does does Microsoft come to you guys and say, "Hey, we'd love to do something with you guys," or or do you go to them? I'm sort of curious the origins of that project. Well, it's a it's a very small industry, and so we all talk to each other all the time. And I've been talking to people at Microsoft forever, just because uh, you it's hard not to get to know people at other publishers. Right. And, as an independent developer, it was important for us as well to be open to other opportunities. And really, in a lot of ways, Sunset was an opportunity to reach a bigger audience, a different audience than we had been reaching on the PlayStation. And I know that when we announced Sunset Overdrive, it rubbed a lot of PlayStation fans the wrong way. But on the other hand, we had also released Fuse, which was a multi-platform game. True. And we had already, so we'd already taken that step of, of saying, we love PlayStation, we love Sony, but we're not just making Sony uh, games. We're also capable of making other games. Therefore, when we talked to Microsoft, the opportunity there was to build a new IP that took some real creative risks that might be appealing to the Xbox fans. And they were really interested in the, the initial, initial premise of Sunset, which was rock and roll in the end times. <laughs> and our, our sort of tongue-in-cheek view of what an apocalypse could be seen through the insomniac lens. Uh, and you were telling me off camera earlier, it it didn't. It started out as a, a bit of a different genre of game than than what the open world extravaganza we ended up getting. Yeah, uh, our first prototypes were actually you building a fort with friends, fighting off hordes of uh, <laughs> demons, so or or mutants. So very similar to a very popular game today. <laughs> which we all sort of chuckle about, but the game did morph or, along the way to something that was more of a story-driven open world game. Uh, mutants, of course, stayed, yeah. and we did have the elements of that base defense that stayed, stuck around, as, which you've seen playing through the single player campaign. When, uh, when did you, I mean, I, I think Sunset was largely well-received. Uh, I'm a big, big vocal proponent of it here at IGN. I, I voted for it for Game of the Year in 2014. Sadly, it lost. No disrespect we to, appreciate your vote. to Dragon Age Inquisition. But um, w is there a point with, with that? I guess, you know, this applies to all your games, too, because you guys have such a great track record. But with Sunset, a new IP new on a new platform, is there a point where you, you knew in that project, like, we're on to something here, like, we've got something good? We have been struggling with figuring out which mechanics were fun. And in fact, we sort of started off as a pure shooter, where we 
we're building cover and trying to decide, should we have standing cover? Should we allow the player to crouch? What kind of layout should we have for enemies? Should this be, uh, should all the setups involve enemies who are lined up like you would see in a typical shooter? Or should it be something else? And when we continued to fail at creating a third person shooter and making it fun, we really had to think differently. And I remember we created this sort of auto junkyard where we had lots of automobiles on the ground and around it we had this big square power line yeah. configuration where you where we just gotten grinding working and you could grind on the power lines. And we were trying to determine if it would be f possible to grind and have fun shooting the enemies because it sounds easy, right? But when you're moving and you're not you're not actually pushing forward on the joystick, you're actually moving at a consistent pace and mm -hmm. turning your aim gets really screwed up. So how do you actually track something that's also moving at the same time? So we would have the we would have the OD, the, uh, the the mutants in the game start to flood into this junkyard, and it was impossible. It just didn't work until we started making the cars bouncy. So you could jump off and you could bounce on the cars, and that was really fun. And then we started increasing the magnetism of the the wires so that when you fell off, you could easily get back on them. And then we started increasing the auto-targeting to some ridiculous degree so that when you actually sort of aimed at a mutant, you would actually hit them. Right. But it didn't feel like we were doing too much of the work for you. So it was sort of that magic combination of all those different levers we were moving that suddenly clicked one day. And that was the light bulb moment for most of us when we realized, okay, we've got something unique here. We've got gameplay that we haven't seen in any other game, and hell, it's kind of fun. And so that was pretty far into production. And once we had discovered that, then we had to start rethinking what the game really was and how the combat scenarios worked and how we were gonna incorporate grinding throughout the city. But it was a, it was a challenge that the team rose to and things moved very fast from that point on. I know uh, Phil Spencer you know, has, has talked a lot about how you know, he sits down with, with builds of games all the time and he's you know, constantly giving his feedback and evaluation. So when, when you're working with him on, you know, you've, you've made this deal, you get this, you're doing this big new IP, and it starts as apparently a, a cover shooter. When you, when you finally sit him in front of the game that it ultimately becomes, what's, what's his reaction to it? Uh, you know what? I wasn't there the first time that he saw whatever build it was that yeah. we sent up, so I don't know. Uh, I remember talking to him, I think, well into production, and he was happy. I think he was laughing at some of the things that we've been <laughs> doing in the game, and that was great. And I know that up to that point, just like in every, with every other game we made, there was a lot of tension on our team, uh, with our publisher, because nobody knew what the game was gonna be. Right? When you don't know what your game is and you can't explain it to somebody, <laughs> it makes it really hard for people on the production team to know what they're building and to have confidence. So I think every project hits those, those moments, those inflection points where all of a sudden people get it. Right? But, and, and usually up until that point, there's only one, there are only one or two people on the team who sort of get it, and it's sort of a, this melange of ideas in their head, and then you just gotta keep getting it out onto the screen and making it playable day after day, and eventually, with enough people collaborating, it can work. So when, when Sunset Overdrive does ship, and it gets mostly really, really great reviews, um, just because of the long-term relationship with Sony, uh, which has clearly been a good relationship. Do you do you hear from anyone at Sony that's like just a you know like a congratulatory hey oh, yeah. this turned out great great job? Yeah, I mean Sony was extremely uh, was what's the word uh, complimentary of the game had and played it for sure. And we had also been working with Sony as well. I mean we were working on Ratchet that's with true. Sony at the, that's same, true. At the yeah. same time, so our relationship stayed very good with Sony. And I think that's this industry is all about relationships, just probably like most industries. But it's important. I think it's really important to maintain good relationships with the people who are on sort of both sides of the fence. With, I mean, from, from our perspective as a developer, we love talking to other developers. Uh, it's really fun to exchange ideas and, and talk about the challenges that we've had to overcome in production. And I love talking to publishers because publishers have a very different perspective on things and they encounter different risks than we do. But I found that universally throughout the industry, we've got people who are passionate about games, right? And it works. And you, I look at our, the people that we work with at Sony and they are, without an exception, passionate about creativity and what games do for culture and how they have become this art form that just continues to evolve. And it's awesome. You get that, when you get those passions that align, magic happens. 
Sunset Overdrive 2 then, why not? While we're on the subject, uh, you're obviously, you've, you're just coming off Marvel Spider-Man now. Is that an option at some point in the future? Is that a thing that creatively you guys would like to go back to that, that you feel business-wise could be viable? Or, or was it sort of a, we tried this, it was good, people liked it, it did well, but you're not gonna go back to it? I, I think one of the great things about starting a franchise and having the opportunity to make sequels is that you've, in many cases, made the hardest decisions already. Right? When you establish an IP, you now you know what the tone is, you know what the character is, you know what the core mechanics are that work, you know what players liked and didn't like. Yeah. So doing a sequel for, for any game, whether it's Sunset Overdrive or something else, is an opportunity to deliver something to fans that's significantly better than the original. And that's something that I'm, you know, I, I think we Insomniac would love to do someday. It's a, for us, it's a timing challenge, it's a bandwidth sure. challenge. But I do, to your point, feel like there are a lot of people out there who love Sunset. And we've certainly been asked frequently by fans, when are you gonna do another one? By, you just got asked yeah, again. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's what happens. Um, Hayes, formerly, the artist formerly known as Overstrike. What happened, like what? You mean Fuse? That's what, Hayes, that's a different game. My goodness. I do remember, I do remember Hayes, <laughs> and I remember. Uh, well, that's embarrassing, but it's, it's okay. I'm human. Um, <laughs> The name change, the project that you know that, that, that there was a, a very obvious change. Uh, games change all the time behind the scenes, and we never see it. But that one had been announced, it had been shown, and then it pivoted. So what was that sort of? Was that an internal decision? Was there what? What ended up? Uh, what's the story behind that game? Well, I'll, I mean, I, I've said this many times. I I made that decision to change the game when we had already announced Overstrike and we changed it to Fuse and that was that's something that I'll I'll take responsibility for and there was a lot that went on behind the scenes in terms of where we where our publisher thought the game was going to end up so I know we disappointed fans when we made that shift and at the same time we stayed true to the gameplay that we had originally envisioned for the mm -hmm. game cooperative Four shooter player, yeah. yeah and i think what what was fun about what we ultimately delivered from from our perspective from a creative perspective was how the constraints that we created allowed us to be really creative within those constraints in terms of how the weapons combined and how the gameplay between the four players ultimately evolved while you were in combat situations that was a that was a cool challenge and fun for us um, obviously we the reception was less than what we wanted, and it was a learning experience. I mean, I, I take the, the lessons that I personally learned on that, and I applied them to future games. Is it, I mean, you guys had, had pretty much always gotten really good reviews on everything, and that might have been the first time where it was less than great. Is that, is, I mean, after you, you still, you pour years and, and uh, of effort and so much, so much uh, love and care into it, is it, are you able to sort of look at it just as a learning experience, or, or does it hurt for a while when you when you see it come out? And I'm, I don't. Th I mean, if you're, whether your aggregate is high or low, when it comes to reviews, I think we all tend to look at the negative reviews for anything and go, oh, maybe we could have done better with that. It doesn't matter what game it is. So certainly there were there were comments and um, suggestions that we took very, you know, we took personally because we're creatives. And that's just, that's just the way this industry works. You put yourself out there and what you're doing is you're saying, in some ways, judge me, <laughs> judge us. This is our creative vision for this game. Do you like it? Do you not like it? What don't you like about it? And hey, we'll listen and we'll get better. Uh, we're proud of what we were able to do. I mean, I talked to, uh, we have many members at Insomniac who are part of the Fuse team and are, we're all, you know, we all worked our butts off on it. Yeah. and. We were, when we got, when we put it out there, we were saying, tell us what you think. And we took it, we accepted it, and we moved forward. So uh, we come now to the Marvel Spider-Man project. Uh, where does that come from? I mean, you've got the great relationship with Sony from over the years, but to the best of my knowledge, you hadn't worked with Marvel in any capacity before. So how does that, uh, that relationship come to be? It was a really interesting sequence of events. Uh, Connie Booth, who is a great friend and also one of our partners at Sony, was down at Insomniac and she said to me one day, what would you think about working on a Marvel game? 
And my immediate reaction was fairly neutral. I, because I, we've been creating our own IP for a long time, I mean, from the very beginning, yeah. and I had never really considered working on someone else's IP. But then I figured I would ask some of the team members, and the response I got was eye-opening for me. <laughs> I mean, most people were, were, the answer was, are you crazy? Of course we're gonna work on a Marvel game. Look at, look at their characters, look at the universe they built, and oh, by the way, uh, I'm an insomniac and I'm a huge Marvel fan, right? That was the response I got from most people I talked to. And so I told Connie, yeah, we'd, we'd really be interested in talking to Marvel and, and seeing what the deal was, meaning how, wh why are they interested? Right. Uh, what could we do together? And so we started having these three-way conversations and it became very clear quickly that Marvel was interested in our take on one of their franchises. They weren't interested in us doing a, a game based on a movie or a comic series. And they said, look, We've got a lot of characters. Pick a character that you guys thinks works. We think works for you, and then we'd love to hear your take on it. So they they just they gave you the carte blanche to just pick one. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It was. It was a pretty amazing experience. So, who, so who's on the short list when you go back? Like, do you make your own list and then take it to the team, or do do you? Uh, do you do like an intra intranet poll on the company? Like, a, how, how's that work? I, I honestly, I can't remember exactly how we did it. I mean, everybody knew that we were talking to Marvel, and everybody knew that we were looking at a whole bunch of characters. And I think, ultimately, after a few uh, discussions, Spider Man rose to the top very quickly. And and that really was because we a lot of us identify with Spider Man. I mean, we as a company feel like we are the underdogs. Usually, we feel like we've always. We're always scrapping for you know, the next big challenge, and we, we thought that he as a character was really compelling because he's so human and he's so relatable, and he's also the most popular Marvel character in the world, I think, but it was more Peter and Spider-Man that drew us to that particular character. Well, I, I mean, if anything, I know I keep coming back, I'm, I'm a, again, I'm an unabashed, huge Sunset Overdrive fan. I, I really, I feel like, if anything, Sunset Overdrive's like a living proof of concept for what a good Spider-Man game could look like, that's right? A, that's a very good point, yeah. <laughs> so we did discuss that too. We realized that, hey, this game that we had just made, Sunset Overdrive, really does, uh, literally helps us think about how we could take traversal to the next level in a Spider-Man game because we had been focusing on many of the same challenges within Sunset Overdrive. How do you, how do you traverse through a city quickly in an, in an entertaining and uh, skillful fashion without being uh, too hard or too easy. So we had, we had dealt with very similar challenges. So as, as game developers, you obviously know the mostly sordid history of Spider-Man video games. Is that, uh, sort of collectively as a team, is that something that uh, sort of hangs over your head like a dark cloud, or is it, do you, optimistically look at it as a challenge of like, okay, well, what did they do wrong and how do we not, you know, how do we do it right? I, we didn't look at it from that perspective. We certainly looked at the previous games and I think most of us had played prior sure. Spider-Man games. Yeah. And our, our general question was, what can we do to take Spider-Man where he hasn't been before, right? Not, not what did other games do wrong, but what can we do that's gonna be very insomniac, that's gonna allow us to kind of breathe our own in, our own sort of take on games into this awesome character and this world he lives in. And what do you think that is? Um, I, I think the, the acrobatic combat is one aspect that I really love. I, just the fact that he, he moves very differently than most other characters out there. And we took advantage of the fact that he's not, he's not a big bruiser. Right. He's, he's agile and he's flexible and he does things that, that we all probably wish we could do. <laughs> And we tried to emphasize that in his combat and in all the skills that you earn and the upgrades that you get. And then there's the, there's the traversal through the city, right? Spider-Man is the ultimate fantasy when it comes to uh, flying, really. I mean, you're not flying, but you sort of are. And if you've we, ever had those dreams as a kid where you could go anywhere or you know, without any constraints, that's basically Spider-Man. <laughs> and so we wanted to de deliver that in, uh, through New York. Are there... Uh... Are there lessons from from Sunset that you apply directly to Spider-Man, or, or is, is traversal the, the big one, it sounds like? Well, traversal was in, in the initial challenge. How do we make it feel f fluid, effortless, but at the same time give you enough challenge to keep it interesting when it comes to swinging through the city, right? That was the balance that we wanted to achieve, and that, that certainly took a while. 
and we had to lean on some of our son's experience, but also discover a lot of new things when it came to webbing. You know, what do you, how, how should webs attach to the buildings? You know, how should, should you, should we actually have them attached to buildings? Well, the answer is yes, if you want to make it an authentic Spider-Man experience. But if that's the case, how do you make it fun? How do you feel that you are without constraints? And that was, that was tricky. Uh, how do you, should we wall run at buildings? Uh, how, what happens when you get to the top of the building? Should we just have you walk over the edge or should we allow you to do something acrobatic? Should it be skill based? Uh, what happens when you are landing on something? Should we halt your momentum or should we make it easy to continue this flow? But if we make it too easy, then there's no skill involved. So the, all of these micro decisions we had to make along the way were things that we were, we were discovering and, and tackling as a team during the first phase of development. Was Marvel as easy to deal with during development as they were beforehand when they just give you a carte blanche? Because, you know, you changed the suit. You did your own take on the suit among other, other story beats that, that are unique to your game. So how, how were they to work with? It's been fantastic. I mean, this, I, but Sony, Marvel, Insomniac, I mean, that triangle has been strong throughout development. There's a lot of mutual trust among all three parties, and I think that's the reason that we were able to, to deliver something that we think is really, really cool and hopefully fans will like. But they were always willing to listen uh, and help brainstorm as well. I mean, Marvel was creatively involved in this game, obviously. Yeah. And I think just as important, Marvel is the ultimate repository of knowledge. So if we have questions about who Peter is, or what would Peter do this, would Peter do that, would Mary Jane do this, uh, would this particular villain actually say something like this, they have the answer. In fact, Bill Roseman, who is their creative director over there, knows more about Marvel than I bet anybody on this planet. I mean, you ask him anything and he will have an answer, even if it's an obscure comic line, he knows it. So it's, it's been a lot of fun working with him. Uh, what does, so what does success look like for you guys with this game? Like, you know, um, you've had plenty of successes over the years, but on paper, between Marvel being bigger than ever, uh, Spider-Man being as, as or more popular than ever, and you're, you've got the first party backing of Sony on, on the PlayStation 4, a massively successful console, uh, are you guys feeling pretty good <laughs> about things right about now? Well, we've all, we've all played through the whole game. Right? We, we've a lot. <laughs> we like I played through this I game so. a heck of a lot, and I can say we are all very proud of of what we've been able to accomplish. And we we love what we make. It's it's really fun to finish a game and to look back and, and say that was fun. We learned a lot making the game. We felt like we were a cohesive team building it, and what we delivered delivers on what we've created delivers on our original vision. And I, I think all of those are true. So now it's just up to the fans. You know, what do fans of Spider-Man, what do fans of PlayStation 4, what do people who've never even paid attention to Spider-Man think? We want to know. Uh, we're hoping that we, we can satisfy you know, their, their fantasies about playing Spider-Man. Well, you just got done saying that uh, you know, sequels, you, you know what you're building, and you can feel really good about, about executing on that. It, it would seem like Sony would be wise to have already locked you into a sequel if this game does well. Uh, do you, uh, are those, when do those conversations happen? Do they happen early? Do you wait till the game's out? When's all that stuff happen? It depends on the game. I mean, <laughs> right, that's a, I know you're not going like, to like announce Spider-Man <laughs> Two right here at this desk. Totally but. evasive answer, I know. <laughs> but you know, for us, it it does. I, what I just said about seeing what the fans think is so important for us as creators because before you can really start thinking about what's next, you want to see what people think uh, of your the last several years of your life, right? <laughs> We've all been putting a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into yeah. this game, and we want to see, did we get it right? You know, did, are there things that, that fans key in on in particular that they, they love? Uh, are there, does it spawn new ideas for us as we think ahead to whatever's next? I mean, it doesn't, as you pointed out, you know, Sunset Overdrive really helped us think, uh, it helped us make this game. There are a lot of things that we've learned about Spider-Man that are going to help for, help us in whatever game we do. And I'll give you an example. The technology that we built for yeah, Spider-Man. It's your tech, right? Yeah. So being able to display New York and to stream it uh, the way we do as you are swinging through the city at ridiculous speeds was, a, was something that our, our core group, which our engine and tools group, took on with, with gusto. 
and was able to deliver and really surprised, I think, a lot of us on the production team when they were able to do things that we just didn't think were possible on the PlayStation. I'm curious, uh, I'm going to ask this question on behalf of Brian Altano, a New Yorker and, and a person who's 100%ed Spider-Man. Uh, I was talking to him before we came in here, and he was saying how much he, he loves how New York the game is in the sense of there are black squirrels and there's little pizza joints all over the place and all sorts of little New York touches that he was noticing. So are there a lot of New Yorkers on the team, or did you go, did, do you guys go out and do any... You know, just do any field research, spend some time in the city, or I think I mean I can't I don't I can't remember how many team members actually went to New York. I know we had several who did, yeah. And certainly, but you know, t today is the age of the internet, right? So, if you want to know what uh, exists on a particular corner in New York, you can find out pretty darn quickly. That's true. If you want to know what the squirrels look like, you can find <laughs> out pretty quickly. And so we did a ton and ton of research uh, on New York just to make sure that it felt authentic. Of course, this is also uh, a unique New York. So you will find things in this city that do not exist in the real New York, but right, will be very- Avengers Tower. Exactly, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. And that's, yeah. that's fun for us. Yeah, uh, I mean, this, is, this isn't necessarily a uniquely Spider-Man question. It might just be every game now you, that you make. It, was Spider-Man the, the most expensive game you guys have made? Is it just, it takes, it takes more and more people and time and resources every single time now, doesn't it? Well, it's easily the largest game we've ever made. I mean, Sunset, uh, New York was 10 times the size of Sunset in terms of the overall geography. Wow. So it's, it's a large game. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, now, you guys have done a few projects on, in VR with Oculus. Uh, are, how are you, are you bullish on the future of VR? How are you, how are you feeling about it after having uh, been been out there developing for it a little bit. Well, we announced Stormland this year, and Stormland shows our evolution. We've, we've been able now to sort of bend the constraints that we believe existed for VR in terms of design quite a bit. And I think it has a lot to do with the VR audience becoming more adept at new experiences within VR. Yeah. As an example, we used to be really afraid of moving the camera. In, um, in VR. For motion sickness reasons? For motion sickness reasons. And, yeah. But now we've, we've done enough experimentation that in Stormland, this is, a, this is a, a game where you are, it's an open world game where you are exploring in VR. And the team has definitely taken on the challenge of comfort and, and done, made a lot of really subtle tweaks that make it much more comfortable to actually move around in a world in VR, which you know, I didn't think was possible a few years ago. Yeah, I feel like it's funny now that you say that. I, I feel like the game VR games I've played lately, like I don't, I don't experience that nauseous feeling anymore. The way that th two years ago, it would, it would happen on a, <laughs> every now and again. Yeah, and I think, I think it's a combination of a couple things. I think it's we, we're all learning. We're yeah. all learning how to do things better in VR. But there's also acclimatization. We, those of us who play VR and use VR, have become acclimatized to more camera motion, for example. Makes sense. Uh, do you, I mean, what do you think it's, it, what it's what's it gonna take for VR to, to break big out of this seeming niche that it's, that it's caught in right now, or, or is that its future? Well, no, I think VR continues to evolve, and I think it evolves in a very quiet way. Hardware continues to change. I think we're seeing more and more powerful uh, platforms in terms of the chips, the GPUs and CPUs that can drive uh, VR. So where it goes is hard to predict, actually. But form factors, as they become smaller, lighter, more portable, I think will enable more adoption of VR. What, uh, like over the years, I mean, you've, you've done a first-person shooter, you've done open-world games, action adventures. Any other genres that you and the team are, are dying to try? <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, I got a, I got, so I do an AMA at Insomniac, uh, ask me anything every day. And so all of Insomniacs will ask me random questions. And the, one of the questions was, are we ever gonna do a fighting game? <laughs> and my answer was probably not. That is one genre we would probably not do. And I usually don't say, I don't say these things publicly because I, I like to say, never say never. Uh, but I don't see us getting into that particular genre. So with the exception of maybe fighting head to head games and racing games, which I don't think we'd be particularly good at, we're pretty open. With that said, we have been learning quite a bit as we've stuck to adventure games. And adventure is sort of a catch-all term right. for games like 
Ratchet, like Spider-Man, like Sunset Overdrive, but they all have very similar elements in terms of design and layout and production. Right. I, d does the, because games are more expensive and they take longer um, and the, the technology is so much more rich, does, does, is that a bit of a limiting factor as to the, the kinds of games that you can reasonably make as an independent studio? Does, does that technology kind of, to kind of narrow your, your genre scope a little bit? I mean, is that fair? Well, every decision we make is, is an important decision when it comes to what we're doing with our engine and our tools, uh, the designs that we are endorsing or embracing in our games because it, they have knock-on effects. So as, as long as, as long as we, the, the more consistent we stay in terms of the decisions we're making, the, the more efficient we can be in production. So again, going back to the Sunset Spider-Man connection, Sunset helped us make better decisions in Spider-Man because we had tackled similar challenges and having tackled them, we could take them take the designs further right. in Spider-Man than we had before. So I, I'm sure any open world developer will tell you the same thing. If you build, let's say if you're building open world, you're, you're dealing with how do I make quests interesting? How do I keep players engaged on my golden path? How do I integrate story and design more effectively? So those are the kind of things that if you, when you continue to tackle those challenges, you get better. So as a company, we, we are, we're not trying to be everything but the kitchen sink. Even though we have made games that you could argue are <laughs> vastly different, they tend to have uh, very similar design and production So challenges. it's smarter to play to your strengths to, in, in some... That was a much more concise <laughs> way to say what I've been trying to say for the last two minutes, so yes. <laughs> um, well, so... Yeah, you know, I was doing some research on you guys. Insomniac has been repeatedly cited as one of the best places to work, both locally uh, and even nationally. So what's your philosophy about, about crunch time, workplace culture, and, and maintaining a work-life balance in, in, while you're doing, you know, ga game development is, as the public sees it, and I think is, seems fairly fair to say, it's, it's such a difficult time-intensive, high-pressure task making games. So, so what is the, the, how do you continue to, to make Insomniac a, a good place to work that, that gets this recognition? Well, first, I'm, I'm glad you acknowledge that game development is difficult. And I, I say that because when I got into games in the early 90s, early mid-90s, people used to say to me when I would go to a party and they'd ask, hey, what do you do? I make games. <laughs> oh, you make games? You must play games all day. That must be the most fun job ever. We still get that <laughs> even here, although that's, we, don't, we don't play games all day either, but no, it's, right. <laughs> you well, have a much harder job. But it is a challenge. I mean, the challenge is you have a lot of moving pieces and you have a lot of people and a lot of people from different disciplines working together to try to craft something that's unique. And, it, and it's not just that it has to be unique. It has to be something that people haven't seen before. And if it's going to be something that people haven't seen before, you don't know what the answers are. You don't know what is going to work. And so a lot of the decisions we make every day, they could be right, they could be wrong. We really don't know until players actually get their hands on it. So it's this, it's a really, it, it's, it's difficult, as you said. But the way we make it work is we engage everybody at the company, not just in the game design and the, the game related decisions, we, we ask everybody, what do you think about how we're doing things? How can we do things better? So it's a very collaborative culture, and we're constantly looking inward and asking, uh, is this process something we can improve? Can we get better here? Can we, can we be better leaders within the company? Can we be better, better mentors to our teams? Can we, can we make decisions earlier? Those are the kind of things that everybody asks and helps answer at Insomniac, and as a result, we can evolve as we take on bigger and bigger challenges. And that's not easy. It takes, I think it takes a lot of willingness to communicate transparently across the company at different levels and helping everybody understand that if you speak up, it's fine. In fact, we expect you to speak up. There's, you can't say anything bad because we're all trying to improve not just our games, but ourselves. Yeah, so you give everybody a voice, basically. That's, yeah. that's, that is, seems to be the key to making Insomniac a great place to work. That's the goal. Now, in practice, it's not easy because people come into Insomniac from other places where 
if you speak up and if you say something negative, you might be punished or there might be negative repercussions in some way. And we try to, I try to make it very clear that, hey, that's not the case here. We want, to hear, we want people to be honest with each other. Because yeah. if you're not honest, then how can we ever make progress? How can we ever make progress? So what's a, what's a post-mortem for you guys look like on a project with, it, that, with that sort of attitude? It's, it's complicated because we're, there are a lot of people who have had different experiences on the project. And we, so we collect a lot of data from uh, discussions, like face-to-face -face discussions with different groups, from surveys that we do, from interviews, post-project uh, post interviews, and we try to make sense of the data. And usually what ends up happening is we prioritize. Okay, a significant amount of insomniacs were really upset about this particular aspect of production. How can we make it better? And then we engage everybody to try to figure out what the solution is. Uh, when you have a company of 300 people, engaging every single person in a solution is not very practical. Yeah. So what we try to do is grab the people who are relevant to the, the problem and the solution and, and tackle it together and then expose that to everybody. Say, hey, here's... Here's the problem. Here's what we're hoping to do about it. What do you think? It seems very logical, democratic right? and, well, and well, diplomatic. And yes, lo logical. I would, yeah. I would agree with that as well. I mean, we try. I mean, I I would I'd hope that everybody wants to generally wants to treat people or should treat people the way they want to be treated. And that's so. that's our philosophy, right? <laughs> I mean, I I want people. I want to treat people the same way I want to be treated. I'm not gonna. So I don't want to uh, set a poor example. So hey. Let's let's be transparent. Let's communicate from the top down. Yeah. Uh, so you got Insomniac remains an independent studio. You will, uh, next year you will celebrate your 25th anniversary, which is which is commendable. That's incredible in this line, uh, this day and age when you know there's so many studios have closed over the years or been acquired or what have you. And in fact, that's kind of what I'm curious is like, is it more difficult than ever to be an independent studio, or is it easier with self-publishing and uh, more platforms like VR, like App Store, all that stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, how have you ever been tempted to, to pick up a, the inevitable calls I'm sure you get from time to time from publishers seeking to want to get to talk to you about an acquisition? Well, to answer your question about whether it's easier to be independent or not, I, I don't know. We've only been independent. So <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I, one of the great things about being independent is that you really are in charge of your own destiny. So we decide what projects we take on. Uh, they may be risky, they may not be risky. We decide who we work with and we make our decisions when it comes to what our culture is and how we make games. At the same time, I, I, I have plenty of friends who are part of larger corporations who do exactly the same thing, who, who are still running their companies, who are making their own decisions and yeah. deciding what games they take on. So I, I really think it just depends on the situation. Uh, who, who is, if, if you are an independent developer and you decide to be acquired, if your partner's ideals match yours and you guys manage to carve out what it is that you want, great. And you've, you've, we've seen it happen again and again. We happen to be in a very unique situation. We're very lucky that we've been able to have the great partners that we have over the last 25 years and have the opportunity to make games like these for so long. It's awesome, and uh, I'm very proud of what the Insomniacs have been able to do, and I, I thank the fans as well for supporting us along the way. Um, last question I have for you, and I'll let you go. Uh, Spider-Man is out now by the time anyone hears this interview, so that's, uh, that's what everybody should go check out. You turned 50 very recently, so a uh, happy belated birthday. Is I'm curious, how, how do you look at, so this, is, this really is, I said it I think towards the beginning of the interview, this is such a young industry in general, how do you look at the next phase of your career? Fifty now, and and you know, there to date there have not been a lot of 60, 65 year old people <laughs> making games. I mean, just just there, like you there know, have been a few, yeah. Well, but so yeah, I mean, I, I want to pose the question to you: Is like, have have you turning fifty thought about that stuff at all, or or if not, think about it now? <laughs> okay, put me on the spot. Let's see. <laughs> next twenty five years of making games. If I'm lucky enough to be making games in 25 years, hell yeah, that's that would be awesome. Uh, and you know, I my dad is in his 70s and is still doing what he loves to do, same same career, and it's awesome. And I look at him and I'm inspired by him because I realize that it, once you find your passion, why not? Yeah. Why not continue doing it? So I don't I 
I can't imagine that within our industry there aren't a whole raft of 50, 60 year olds who are thinking about the next 20 years and going, okay, what's the next big challenge I get to tackle? And, that, and that's a lot of the ways, I, that's the way I think about it. When I think about what we've just accomplished recently, I think about, okay, what's the next thing? What, what's, what are the next problems we get to solve as a company, as a team, uh, as creatives? And that, that is what got me into the industry in the first place, being able to solve those creative challenges or solve challenges creatively with the team. And I imagine that as the technology evolves, as our fans continue to grow, as gaming just becomes this, this continues to be this worldwide phenomenon, it just opens up more opportunities for all of us to do what we love. If you could go back uh, and, and give 25 year, years ago, you was just starting uh, Insomniac, advice and or show young Ted Price Marvel Spider-Man, what do you think that conversation would look like? If I was giving myself advice? Yeah. Buy Google and Amazon, <laughs> right? <laughs> buy those stocks when they come out. Uh, game advice, that's a great one. I, I probably would have tried to code more than I did, but then again, I would have gotten in everybody's way, so maybe that would have been bad advice. Um, there's a lot of production advice I would have given myself. And I know you're looking for more of the pithy sort no, of No, I mean, hey, whatever thing. comes to mind, that's the point. There were so many, I mean, I made so many bad decisions along the way in terms of um, probably letting my ego get in the way early on. I think I would have told myself to be real, willing to let go creatively more frequently than I did, especially in the first few games, because I felt like I had to be sort of the one to make the calls. Even though I was trying to foster a collaborative culture, if I wasn't involved, I felt like I was not doing my job. Yeah. When in reality, if as somebody who attempts to lead creatives, if you can you know, empower people to make their own decisions and trust them to make great decisions, they're gonna make great decisions. And I, I just, I learned that pretty late. Well, Ted Price, thank you so much for coming by. The game, of course, Marvel Spider-Man, it's out now on PlayStation 4. Uh, of course, PS4 Pro compatibility as well if you've got, if you've got that uh, upgraded console. We wish you the best of luck with it. We're having a lot of fun with it here at IGN. And, uh, thanks. thanks so much for coming on. Hope we'll see you again. That's another edition of IGN Unfiltered in the Books, the monthly chat I am so lucky to get to have with the best, brightest, most fascinating minds in the games industry. Tune back every month for a new episode. And for more of these, look them up on YouTube or your favorite podcast service as well.